And now it is my pleasure to invite our pastor, Reverend John, to introduce our guest speaker. Enough knowledge, my friends, in that back there. Good morning, Good morning. family and friends. I discovered uh, yesterday that our guest speaker and I are born in 19, both, were both born in 1943 in October. Isn't spirit just wonderful? That's a synchronicity. Welcome, my brother. Our guest speaker is Professor Emeritus of History, as well as research professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, and visiting fellow at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies at UWI Mona. He has lectured and written widely on the Garvey movement and has been editor-in-chief of the Marcus Garvey and Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, papers for more than 30 years. In 1972, Esquire magazine named him one of the top 10 scholars in America. I think he's gone up on the, the scale to perhaps in the top two. We are doubly blessed to have him. We had him last night and it was wonderful. And now we have him this morning. And we are going to be uh, having the opportunity to dialogue with him after in a special discovery session. But this is really... A, a, our, our way of marking the 100th anniversary of Science of Mind. And I can think of no better person to share with us uh, his, his deep knowledge of the first national hero of Jamaica. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Professor Robert Hill. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and thank you. I know it's an early hour for some of us, but it's wonderful to welcome and have this life to experience one of the great pleasures of life, a Jamaican morning. I've always said that whenever I come back to Jamaica, I know I'm home when I welcome that scent and the feeling of the early morning Jamaica. First of all, I'd like to thank Reverend John and all of the members of this Temple of Light and Center for Spiritual Living for welcoming myself and my wife, Diane, so warmly and so graciously into the community. It is a kind of, it is a real homecoming for me. I was born and I grew up not far from here at the top of Mountain View Avenue at number four Creef Road. I think with a strong arm, you could actually throw a stone <laughs> to where I grew up. And I remember this area well. I remember it not for the stately, beautiful homes that are in this community, I was trying to focus this morning on what is it that I remember about this, this area. And the thing that I can say that I remember are the trees, the beautiful Ponciana trees that you see in the gardens here. Those I remember, those trees and their color. So thank you again for this beautiful welcome. And I want to let you know that whenever we are visiting 
Kingston from our home in St. Anne, we intend to come back and visit with you. Thank you. All seven volumes? No. <laughs> Last night, when we were here, we talked with you about the metaphysical side of the teachings of Marcus Garvey. Some of you found that surprising. And Professor Rupert Lewis talked about the difficulty of linking Garvey's metaphysics with his politics. But in a sense, it has been right there before us from the very inception of Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association. And it, it consists of those two words, universal Negro. Today, we confuse the meaning of universal with what today we call diaspora. That's not the meaning of universal. People believe that when Garvey named his organization the Universal Negro Improvement Association, he meant Negroes in Jamaica, Trinidad, South Africa, North America, meaning diaspora. No, not so. The word universal connotes universalist or universalism and that word has a deep metaphysical meaning if you say that you are an exponent of universal brotherhood which is what the meaning of the UNIA derived from universal brotherhood, what it means is that within each of us is a universalist principle. It doesn't mean diaspora or scattered, which is how we have come to transpose the meaning of universal. Universal is at its root a metaphysical concept. That is, you are in tune with the infinite. Now what happened is that this movement, the political impact of the movement was so strong that that universalist interpretation of the very name of his organization got pushed to the side. I think that what we should be doing is restoring the metaphysical underpinning of universalism to link it back with its political significance. Now, where did the name come from? It's very interesting uh, because the name of the organization was twofold the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. Why would Garvey uh, found an organization with such a top-heavy set of titles? My research discovered that there was a man in England who Garvey was mentored by. He was an English cleric and his name was Reverend Charles Garnett. 
he was a congregational minister. And Charles Garnett was a congregational minister, but also an exponent of a very important religion that grew up in the 19th century called Theosophy. It is associated with a very famous Russian woman, Madame Helene Blavatsky. And this religion called Theosophy is founded on a very important book called The Secret Key. And Garvey, through his connection with Reverend Charles Garnett, not only was acquainted with theosophy, but that word that I stress, universal, really comes through the teachings of theosophy. Reverend Charles Garnett founded an organization very, very similar to Garvey's UNIA, and which I avow the UNIA was based on. Reverend Garnett's organization, the title of it was the League of Universal Brotherhood and Native Races Association. That organization developed links with black people all across southern Africa. And when South African Africans came to England to protest or to petition the British Crown or the British Colonial Office, they were hosted on their visits to England by the League of Universal Brotherhood and Native Races Association. Garvey was linked with a second organization during his sojourn in England between 1913 and 1914. That organization was called the Brotherhood Movement. The Brotherhood Movement developed into the largest revival movement in Great Britain prior to World War I. It was the descendant of the famous Dwight Moody revival of 1879, which swept England and Scotland and the British Isles. Many of you will have heard that during his sojourn in England, Garvey traveled extensively on the continent of Europe. Some of you may not know this, but Garvey became engaged to a young English woman. What I discovered was that Garvey was recruited by the Brotherhood Movement and became part of their traveling delegation on the continent of Europe. I go so far as to suggest that when Garvey returned to Jamaica in 1914, he returned in July of 1914, just on the eve of the outbreak of World War I, Garvey was actually coming back to Jamaica to establish the Brotherhood Movement in Jamaica on behalf of those patrons that he had found in England. It was the outbreak of World War I that intervened and aborted Garvey's plan that would have established the Brotherhood Movement. In fact, Garvey's manifesto, Garvey's public statements all suggest he speaks 
extensively about his white patrons in England and that they are waiting to extend the hand of brotherhood to the movement in Jamaica. It was World War I that severed the connection between the white patrons in England and Garvey's nascent UNIA in Jamaica. In other words, when Garvey came back to Jamaica, he had already a highly developed notion of universalism, which he gained and acquired during his sojourn in England and Europe. What I'm trying to establish is that when you read a title or a series of words, just like the phrase new thought, do not let the banal, everyday connotation of those words block you from recognizing that there is more to the words than meets the eye. For example, the phrase that we use so freely, new thought, new thought this and new thought that, the term, those two words, new thought, when I first encountered that phrase, I kind of scratched my head and thought, really? New thought, but that don't sound too dread. That doesn't sound too powerful an idea. In other words, as I will read to you now from Garvey's a quotation where Garvey uses that term, new thought. For example, in 19, October of 1928, on a visit to the city of Paris, Garvey gave a speech at Club de Faubourg, 6 October 1928. And here is Garvey speaking, quote, I bring to you a message from the Negroes of the world. I represent the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which has 11 million members. We represent a new thought in the Negro race. It is because we recognize France So Garvey cites the, the term, we represent a new thought of the Negro race. Now, you could say, OK, the meaning is fairly obvious. We have a new set of beliefs. But if you understand Garvey's deep metaphysical training, then that word in that context, new thought, could also be a reference to his metaphysics. Here is another example. Near the end of his life, this is in July of 1938. Garvey writes in his final publication, The Black Man, in a statement entitled The Unsteady World, Garvey writes, quote, within the last 10 years, the world has gradually grown more unsteady. New thought and skill must be centered on this particular subject. It is only with the organized and strong arm of the Negro that he can succeed in forcing his oppressors to see the thing that he needs and must get. 
Once again, the use of the word, the phrase new thought, can be written off as a banal expression, meaning we need to develop some new ideas. But Garvey, throughout his writings and speeches, keeps referring again and again to something called new thought. But he doesn't make it out to be a religious idea. He seeds, he seeds his speeches and writings with this word new thought, this term. And then finally, Garvey says, quote, to rise out of this racial chaos, new thought must be injected into the race. And it is this thought that the Universal Negro Improvement Association has been promulgating for more than 20 years. Now, Marcus Garvey was not the first black man to embrace the teachings of new thought. When I first encountered the teachings of new thought, I had never, ever associated that with Garvey. As I intimated last night, that was one of what I considered to be my most significant historical discoveries, the link between the philosophy, the metaphysics of success, and new thought in Garvey. But most people don't know that it is new thought that was at the foundation of another important movement that preceded Garvey. And I'm referring here to the movement of the great Father Divine. Many of you have heard of Father Divine. Father Divine was immortalized in song in 1944 when the American composer heard from his publicist about this black man in Harlem who had put together this large following during the Depression. And Father Divine taught his followers when people were going hungry and they were penniless and homeless, Father Divine fed all who came forward. Father Divine housed and employed anyone who wanted to work. And the song that became famous in 1944 and 1945 and actually won an Oscar because it was used in a film in 1944 and it's called Accentuate the Positive. That was Father Divine. That thought, Accentuate the Positive, comes out of New Thought. Father Divine was converted to New Thought in California during a visit to California in 1907 by the New Thought leader, Charles Fuller, the founder of the movement called Unity, the Unity School. Sorry, thank you. Charles Fillmore, the founder of the Unity School of Christianity. Father Divine was such a strong exponent of new thought that Father Divine said, the reason I am successful is because I am not a Negro. Really? Father Divine was a 
very black man. <laughs> and Father Divine said, and all of these people who are my followers do not belong to something you call the Negro race. And Father Divine's movement was completely integrated, blacks and whites. Even out in Australia and New Zealand, Father Divine had followers. Father Divine said, you see, if you believe you are a Negro, you have already admitted to your mental inferiority. Now today we would think, Father Divine, what are you doing? What Father Divine had cottoned onto and had grasped is that this term Negro was invented in order to keep you in your place. So here is my challenge to you. In fact, Father Divine went even further. Father Divine says, New Thought teaches us that we are all divine. And that name, divine, signified that because divine was not his birth name. Father Divine said, New Thought teaches us that the divine spark is within each of us. And therefore, Father Divine said, I proclaim myself to be God. Woo. <laughs> In other words, Father Divine pushed the teaching of New Thought to its logical conclusion. And so, here is my challenge to you. Marcus Garvey started a conversation. Marcus Garvey did not complete the conversation. He initiated a conversation between metaphysics and the teachings of mind mastery and mental therapeutics and black people. And we still have to carry on this conversation. In some ways, it's still a debate. Can we find a way to make compatible the teachings of metaphysics and racial identity. Follow me now. Follow me. Garvey may have begun to initiate that conversation in 1912, 1913, and then in Jamaica in 1914 when he established the UNIA. What Garvey believed, as I shall read to you in a moment, was that new thought authorized him to link his vision of racial emancipation with the metaphysics of the divine. But a case can be made, which I make here, that it's not obvious to me that the teachings of metaphysics allows for a belief in the primacy of race. In other words, what Garvey said was that we, black people, are suffering from an illness. We have been damaged by white supremacy that teaches us 
that we are an inferior race of people. It has made us ill. But then you can't use what makes you ill to get well. In other words, what I'm saying is that today new thought thinkers have to grapple with this still incomplete conversation. Is there a place for racial identity within the doctrine of the divine principle of metaphysics. Now, I want to leave you with two final quotations. When, in the late 1920s, for the Divine's movement was raging in America, the Garvey movement was an easy prey to for Father Divine. Father Divine picked off, just picked off, some of the key leaders of the UNIA. A woman who was known here in Jamaica, for example, Madame Demina. She became a convert of Father Divine. Madame Demina was the woman who rode the white stallion during Garvey's convention parade here in Jamaica in 1929 with her sword. She goes back to America and Father Divine picks her off. Many, many people in the early 30s left the Garvey movement and became converts to Father Divine's movement. And here is what Garvey says. speaking in Jamaica in 1929. I don't think that anyone who gets up to attack religion will get the sympathy of this house. Garvey was speaking at Edelweiss Park. For the Universal Negro Improvement Association is fundamentally a religious institution. Garvey is defending the UNIA from the attraction that Father Divine's movement has for many of his followers. And then Garvey concludes, listen to this carefully, because it illustrates my earlier point about the banal appearance of the term. Garvey says, it is useless for somebody to get up with some new thought, endeavoring to tell me there is no God, no need to belong to any church, and expect me all in a sudden to give up all the beliefs of my fathers and follow him when he's not a God, when he cannot perform miracles. That phrase, to uh, to get up with some new thought, is an allusion to the teachings that Father Divine was promoting. In other words, Garvey knew that he was facing strong competition from the Father Divine Movement, which was preaching new thought. Now, what we will now conclude by saying is that Garvey always stressed that black people had the wrong conception of God. Garvey said, as I shall read, from one of his speeches now for you, that what God means to us is a scientific understanding of creation. 
Garvey said, get yourself, as the white race has done, a scientific understanding of God and religion. God is in you. God has done all for you already that he will ever do for you on this earth. He made you, and after he made you, he was through with you to the extent where he expects a report of you at the end of your journey. Between your creation and your natural death, God has nothing to do with you physically and materially. You understand, you understand that? Take that down on the notebook of your skull, on the notebook of your mind. Do you see so many white people in Jamaica going to the doctor? <laughs> Have you ever seen so many of them at the doctors when you get there? No, because they are more intelligent. They live by science. You do everything by emotion. That makes the vast difference between the two races. Then Garvey concludes, I cannot go into details, but what I want to drive home to you is to avoid all the bad. Go forward in the world as Negroes if you must get better and a more scientific understanding of yourself, of nature, and of God. If you are to live as man and as a people, God is no huge monster. God is not a huge beast. There is no law for God to come from heaven and lead you because you, you yourself are God. Get a scientific knowledge of religion, of God, of what you are, and, you, and what you create will be a better world for yourselves. Negroes, the whole world is yours for the making. Here you see Garvey trying to translate the metaphysical science of religion. Where would he have gotten that from? He wasn't preaching theology. He was preaching the scientific knowledge of self, of the divine within you. And so what I want to say and leave you with is the realization that Garvey was a new thought exponent masquerading as a black nationalist. <laughs> Let me repeat that. Garvey was an apostle of new thought therapeutics, which he applied to the condition of the Negro race, from which came the perception of Garvey as a black nationalist. But that black nationalism was so strong, was so extraordinary, that it pushed to the margin Garvey's deeper philosophy. But that philosophy is not static. It still demands interrogation. It still demands a continuing debate. Can you be both a Negro and a New Thought exponent? Each of us will have to choose where we come down, what side we come down on. But thank you again for inviting me and allowing me to share a few of my thoughts with you. God bless you. God.